Good morning, church. I want to start with a mass confession here today, and you don't have to raise your hands on this one, all right? Don't want to stress anybody out there because I think this one applies to to all of us here. I'm going to make it easy. Keep your hands down. How many of us have ever done something really stupid in our lives? I mean, something you look back on now and think, how could I have ever been so dumb that I didn't have the sense God promised to go. You know, that, that kind of that dumb stuff, you know. John Wayne, the actor, said, I, life is tough, but it's tougher when you're stupid. And uh, I, I can probably get an amen on, on that one. Now, I would never call anyone stupid, but boy, I can look back on my own life and think, I've really done some stupid things. Uh, and, and for you, maybe as we think about, you know, the collection of people that we have, maybe it was a bad investment. Maybe we took someone's foolish advice and it cost us. Maybe we made some bad financial decisions and we ended up in debt up to our eyeballs. All right. Perhaps it was an ill-advised relationship that turned toxic. Maybe it was hanging around the wrong crowd when we were teenagers and somebody sort of pressured us into doing something. And then there was the time we blew up and said all the things we shouldn't have said. And boy, you know what a mess that was. The Bible has a word for that. It's not stupid. It's not dumb. The Bible's word is fool. That word appears more than 110 times in the Bible. And the sister word to it, foolish, appears about 80, 81 times. And by far, the book where it's used most often is in the book of Proverbs, where it occurs a whopping 71 times times. Here's an example, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 6, abandoning your foolishness and live and proceed in the way of understanding. Or chapter 14, verse 16, a wise man fears God and turns away from what is sinful, but a fool is full of pride and is not careful. One version translates this, I love this translation, fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. Have you ever plunged anything with reckless confidence? What's that look like? Maybe it looks something like this guy right here. Look where he's sawing on the, yeah, I don't know, he's got his safety glasses on, but I'm not sure that's going to be enough there. D.L. Mooney was preaching one time, and he used to get notes, anonymous notes from people, and they would be critical notes. But he got a note one time, and uh, there was just one word on it that said, fool, fool. So he got up behind the pulpit, and he said, you know, I usually get anonymous letters from people that aren't signed. This is the first time that the person signed the letter and forgot to write the note. Well, you know, sometimes it's easy to identify foolish actors unless we're the one playing the role. So let me ask you this question this morning. If you could ask God for one thing in your life and you knew for a fact that he would give it to you, what would you ask for? This morning, we're going to begin a new series of messages on the book of Proverbs centered around the theme, Living Full Proof. Now, after naming that, I realize that's a little bit ambitious because regardless of how many principles from God's Word we apply to our life, we're still going to make mistakes in the future, unfortunately. So maybe a better title would be Full Reduction, but that doesn't have the same ring to it, so I'm going to stick with Full Proof. And if you need... To, to live more foolproof, finding wisdom for every area of your life, morally, relationally, vocationally, financially, spiritually, whatever it is, then I can't think of a better place to look than the place we're going to look over the next few weeks, the book of Proverbs. If you ever thought the Bible's outdated and the Bible's irrelevant, you've never read the book that we're going to be getting into over these next few weeks. The book of Proverbs is so uh, relevant to our current culture. Its verses are short. They're like little bite-sized nuggets of wisdom, little spiritual tweets for the soul. Let me give you an example of a few here. Proverbs 18, verse 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. Boy, have you ever found that to be true? Someone says something and it just destroys you, or they say something and it, and it really builds you up. Here's another one, Proverbs 16, 7, when the ways of a man are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even those who hate him to be at peace with him. That's the kind of life I want to live. And I like this one here too, this is a good one. Gray hair is like a crown of honor. It is earned by living a good life. So I always wanted to be in the honors club, all right? See the wisdom that's in this book for crying out loud. Now, before we jump into our foolproof project, we need to lay a little bit of foundation here. How about some background to the book of Proverbs? What's it all about? It's written somewhere around 900 BC. 
That's almost 3,000 years ago, but boy, it is so relevant to our lives today. The author is Solomon, the king. Um, he writes some other books in the Bible, and he writes about 95% of the book of Proverbs. There's uh, help with a few other authors. And the word wisdom is mentioned about 50 times throughout the book. The first reference is in the first chapter of the book that Jeff read, and then the last reference is in the last chapter of the book. And that's where I want to begin this journey when it comes to living foolproof, and that is in getting wisdom. In chapter 4, in the book of Proverbs, here's a passage of Scripture. If you have your Bibles open, you can follow along with me, verses 5 through 7. Get wisdom, get understanding, don't forget my words or swerve from them. Don't forsake wisdom, she'll protect you, love her, she'll watch over you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom, though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. That's what Solomon's talking about throughout the entire book. Make sure you get wisdom. Whatever you have to do, whatever you have to change, whatever you have to give up, get wisdom. And so the question is this, what is wisdom? And I've put a couple of definitions down here for you to sort of help us make this practical. Wisdom is the ability to see life on ourselves as God sees each. Wisdom is also the ability to make good decisions in difficult situations. You look at it and say, what's the wise thing to do? One of the most important questions you can ever ask. The difference between knowledge and wisdom is clear. Today our culture tells us what people need is, is education. Knowledge is power. But really, that is what is missing in most people's lives? Is it just knowledge? If I was just a better Jeopardy champion, I could, you know, handle my life and my problems so much better. You can learn knowledge, but it doesn't become wisdom until you put it into practice. Knowledge is learned. Wisdom is lived. Here's a quote from the old preacher Spurgeon who said, Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is to not be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all greater fools for it. There's no fool so great as a fool as a knowing fool, but to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. So if you want knowledge, you go to Siri. If you want wisdom, you go to Scripture. In a world that wants to do its own thing and go its own way, the Bible holds out a wisdom. It cannot be Googled. The words and the stories and the principles may be ancient, but they're far from irrelevant. So knowledge is just acquiring information, and that's important. But wisdom is the ability to apply that knowledge to everyday life. I like the way someone put it. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in your fruit salad, all right? So that's the, isn't it interesting that we're living in a day when because of technology and information and knowledge, they're all exploding, yet so many people are hungering for answers and wisdom just to everyday living. Someone put it like this, we're drowning in information, but we're starving for wisdom. So here's the question, how can we acquire wisdom? Let me give you some answers to that today. First of all, by submission to God's authority. One of the very first things that Solomon pens in chapter 1 that Jeff read serves as a foundation, the key takeaway for the whole message on wisdom. The fear of the Lord, it says, is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Look how it's put over in chapter 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's the key, the foundation. You ever per been around a person who doesn't want any help, doesn't want any instruction, you can't tell them anything, they already know everything? You ever told your kid, you know, you need to, I know, I know, I know, and then they do something and you realize, no, you don't know how much you don't know about that? Solomon says the foolish person just despises wisdom and instruction. Proverbs tells us to, to hunger for that. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And you say, well, what's that mean, the fear of the Lord? Well, there should be a holy respect for God and his power. It's an acknowledgement that God's all-powerful, God's all-knowing. The universe revolves around him. It revolves because of him. It's a holy respect, a holy reverence for God. Jesus would put it this way in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. In other words, fear God. But when we hear that, we're thinking, does that mean I'm to live terrified of God? 
How do I balance that with the fact that he's a loving God and he cares for me? Well, this comparison maybe doesn't measure up fully and completely, but think of it this way. Think of it in terms of a great, godly, earthly father. That father's firm, he's fair, at times he's feared, but he's still loved. His children have a healthy awareness of who he is and what he has the authority and power to do. I think of that old Chronicles of Narnia series that C.S. Lewis wrote, and there's a character in there, Aslan, who represents Jesus Christ. He's the lion in the series, and the children are drawn to him, and they're frightened at the same time. And at one point, one of the kids asks, is he safe? And his friend says, no, he's not safe, but he is good. And that's a good picture of God our Father. He can be a God of wrath, but he's a God who's a forgiving God. He's a loving God. So right at the foundation, right at the very heart of all the book of Proverbs teaches us about living with the knowledge of the fear of God, it says, do that. Have a healthy respect and reverence for him. That will be the beginning of wisdom in your life, a submission to his authority. One of the most famous passages in the entire book Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 just reminds us of that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. and all your ways, submit, submission. Submit to him, and he'll make your path straight. Listen, your priorities will determine your path. Now, usually in that passage, we just stop with those two verses. Look at what the next verse says. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and shun evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. The beginning of wisdom is having a reverence for God and recognizing he is all wisdom, he's all-knowing, and looking to him, seeking his direction, submitting to his way. Now, I've got a little bit of uh, uh, illustration up here this morning that many people have you sort of joked about already, you know, that you're at the end of your rope and uh, all kinds of stuff here, using these stale dad jokes the praise team you know where in the world would they get stuff like that i have no idea but here i have a rope from here to here and that represents that's about 168 inches let's say that represents 168 hours in the week that represents one week all right so you got one week laid out here in rope 168 inches and so you have your work week and you've got about uh, i don't know 40 50 hours of that right and then you got your sleep time, and uh, yes, let's say seven or eight hours, and so 50, 55, whatever. And so we put them all together, we've got about 100 hours or so there with work and sleep, or school and sleep, whatever it is. And uh, you throw in some, some exercise time here, throw in some exercise time, you throw in some eating time, and then you got, you know... Uh, 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 the rope coming over this way, and, but you still have so many things left over here. You've got so many other activities, right? You've got stuff you've got to do with the kids. You've got practices. You've got games. You've got um, yard work that you do, all the other activities. So you've got a whole bunch of stuff left over, though. Now, let's say I want to have a closer connection with God. I want to have a, 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 a relationship with him where I grow in wisdom and his power. I want to draw near to him. Here's the thing. You make the decision how you're going to fill all this extra time in your life. You've got hobbies, family stuff, practices, all this stuff. When I was growing up, I had a drug problem. I got drugged to church on Sunday morning, got drugged to church on Sunday night, got drugged to church on Wednesday night. Some of you maybe grew up in a home like that. Maybe you grew up in a home where your parents never took you to church at all. I don't know. But what I do know is that things have changed in our culture over the last generation or two. When it comes to the, 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 the family of God, the church service, the, the, the assembly. Now the average person who attends church services considers themselves a regular attender if they attend on average over the whole year on average less than two times a month. You say, well, how do you come less than two times a month? That's an average over a whole year, less than two times a month. So let's round that up to two times a month. Let's be generous. And say the time it takes to get here and the time it takes to get home, you visit a little bit, the length of the sermon, the length of the, the, the service, whatever. Let's say about two hours each month. Two times a month, there's two hours each time. I'm sorry, that's about four altogether. And that's all the time that God gets. Now, I have uh, an assistant down here. If he would pull up the rest of that rope, and I know we got some slack there, so you're just going to have... Imagine this rope continues on through the wall. I should have had Greg go outside and stand on the other side of the wall, but I'm going to have him stay right there. 
it goes through the wall. That represents the rest, the rest of the month. So you got a whole month now if you take that rope clear out to the end. I want to show you something. This piece of tape represents then, on average, the time we give to God in a church service throughout the month. Right there. Uh, one church expert, Rainer, says this. It, it's even worse. One church growth expert who studies these things has discovered that the once a month church grower is the fastest growing segment of church life. Now, how in the world does this propel us into a passionate, loving, growing relationship with the creator of the universe? See, there's got to be more than that, right? Look at all this I have here. There's got to be more than that piece of tape. And there's got to be more than just a, a church service. Don't, don't misunderstand. But when we give ourselves to, you know what, uh, getting involved in serving and Bible studies and small groups and getting into the Word and our prayer life, God's wisdom begins to take root, and, and that tape widens and begins to just sort of spread out into other areas of our life. But if I just throw him the leftovers, I'm not going to experience a changeover. Thank you, Greg, for that help this morning. Growth and change happen slowly over time. And it happens when we get into healthy rhythms in our priorities. And our priorities determine our path. Jesus put it like this. Seek first the kingdom of God, then he'll take care of our needs. Here's the second area. We get wisdom by requesting it from God in prayer. Solomon's the author of this book. One time God came to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, and he said, Solomon, what do you want from me? I'll give you whatever you want from me. What if God came to you and said, I'll give you whatever you want? What are you thinking here? Powerball, right? I mean, what are you thinking here? Cash, Cadillac, snow colds, long life. But look at what Solomon asked for. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 7. He says, my Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I'm now only one little child and don't know how to carry out my duties. So give your servant, one version says, wisdom, some of the versions say discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. Discerning heart means wisdom. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Did you get that? He asked God for a discerning heart for wisdom. And the Lord's so pleased with Solomon's request, he not only gives him wisdom, he throws in a bunch of other blessings. What is one area of your life right now, one decision, one battle you're facing where you could use some wisdom? Here's what James chapter 1, verse 5 says. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask of God. So maybe we pray a prayer or something like this. Dear God, I look to no one else for wisdom. I humbly ask for your help in making these very important decisions in my life because I don't know how to make it without you. Please give me direction and wisdom so I can make the right decision and bring glory to your name. Here's a third way we get wisdom. We get wisdom from the interaction with godly people in our life. The Bible says here in Proverbs in chapter 27, as iron sharpens iron, so one person's life sharpens another. Isn't that a great verse? The book of Proverbs relates over and over and over again that an individual is someone who just makes himself an island. That person's a fool. I don't need any help. I can do it on my own. The Bible says here in Proverbs in chapter 12 and verse 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. It's what a wise person does, but there's a catch. There's a whole lot of us who would seek advice all the time, but we'll seek it from friends, we'll seek it on Facebook, and we'll get on the phone, we'll seek it from self-help books, but here's the problem. So many people will seek advice until they find the advice they are seeking. That's not wisdom. That's just going until you hear what you want to hear. And your spiritual enemy will always see that there's always some fool who will tell you what you want to hear. If a man wants to make a fool of himself, he'll always find plenty of help. There was an old Scottish woman that went from home to home across the countryside selling buttons and threads and shoestrings. And when she came to an unmarked crossroad, she would toss a stick up in the air and go in the direction of the stick, which the stick landed. And one day, though, she was seen throwing the stick up and down several times, several times, over and over again. And one of her friends said, why are you tossing the stick more than once? And she said, it keeps pointing to the left, but I want to go to the road on the right. And some people just keep throwing sticks up in the air until they hear what they want to hear. 
But wisdom is the ability to seek and surrender to the right advice, even when it's not the advice you're seeking. But we follow the crowd, don't we? Look at that. Tax avoidance advice. Hey, buddy, I want that. April 15th's coming up. The meaning of life, uh, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. Is what you're looking for worth living for? Where are you going to be when you get to where you're going? Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20 says, listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end, you'll be counted among the wise. I love this one. This one's a great one. Go and mark this one in your Bible. Chapter 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise, become wise. A companion of fools suffers harm. About 25 years ago, I got a call in the office from a woman who walked with another woman every day. They were companions. But on this particular day, the one woman had threatened to punch the other woman in the face. Guess what? They didn't walk anymore together after that. And yes, by the way, it was two West Siders, okay? So when you, when you see two people walking together, you know instinctively there's some kind of a relationship there, some kind of connection. Walk with the wise, he says. When somebody invites you to go on a walk with them, it's an invitation into community. And the Bible repeatedly tells us that who you choose to walk with dramatically affects your level of wisdom. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says this, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? There's a connection that influences our direction. In high school biology class, we learned about permeable Membranes. I got some high school students down here. They probably tell us everything about this, I'm sure. Those microscopic thin walls that allow particles to pass back and forth and back and forth. And the book of Proverbs says that our lives are like that. The values, the morals, the convictions, the ideas of the people we choose to hang around with will eventually find its way into our lives. Whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not, you are connected to, eventually agree with, affected by the people you choose to have around you. How many times have you heard it, show me your friends, I'll show you your future? Another way to say it is, show me your companions, I'll show you your character. Show me who you're walking with, give me a picture of that, and I'll give you a picture of your destiny. See, when you walk with wise people, almost by osmosis, there's wisdom that seeps into your life. Their values will raise the bar with your values. Their connections will, connections will begin to crystallize with your convictions. And, and when you walk with the wise, their wisdom seeps into you. And the problem is the opposite is also true. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, bad company corrupts good morals. When you walk with fools, their faulty values will begin to seep into and weaken the foundation of your life. Their faulty moral compass will also head you off in the wrong direction. Remember that verse, Proverbs 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise, become wise. A companion of fools suffers harm. The kind of person you become, listen, the kind of person you become is largely related to the kind of people you hang out with. Think back on one of the biggest regrets in your life. Maybe it's the weekend you wish never happened. Maybe it's the Friday night you wish you could erase. My guess is on those biggest regrets, there were some people hanging around you that just weren't very wise at all. Who you and I become are largely related to who we connect with. Show me your community. I'll show you your character. Here's number four. We get wisdom from the application of God's word to our lives. Here's the Captain Obvious quote from the morning. Wisdom is found in the Bible. Duh. (laughs) We know, Mark, genius that you are. That's why we're here. But did you know this? Not everyone who reads the Bible is wise. I know a lot of people throughout my years in ministry who knew a lot about the Bible. But boy, they're simpletons when it comes to wisdom in their life. Any fool can read the Bible. The difference between a wise person and a foolish person is actually applying that principle to your life and obeying it. In fact, a good definition of wisdom would be this. It's the application of biblical truth to life. It's asking what is the wise thing to do and then doing it. We just read from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, in all your ways submit to him, he'll direct your paths. Look at this, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, without guidance from God, law and order disappear, but God blesses everyone who obeys his law. And then there's Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember them, don't you? Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock, and it stood. This book gives wisdom. And the thing of it is, it gives wisdom when there's application. 
It's not enough just to have wisdom laying around in the seat of the car (laughs) or on an app on your phone. You have to apply it to where it's needed most. Now, possibly this summer, some of you, like us, be going to the beach. I don't know if you go to Myrtle Beach, you'll go to uh, Florida, whatever it is. And let's say you haven't had much sun before you've gone down there. So you look, you're as white as shark bait, right? Okay, so you show up down there and you get this 30, this is 30, P, uh, whatever it is, 30, okay? That's 30, SPF, there it is. So you take it to the beach with you and you set it by your towel and you know, you wipe the sand off of it and you keep it looking nice and, and you just set it there by your towel and, and, and it's a really hot day, it's July or whatever and by 2 p.m. you're redder than an overdrawn account at the blood bank, right? And why? You didn't apply it. Nobody ever shows up at the ER with major sunburn and says, oh, I didn't know you actually had to spray <laughs> and then rub it in. We all know that. And some of you are getting burned by situations in your life, in your home, in your relationships, in your finances, because you've never applied God's wisdom to the circumstance. I remember a few years ago, a few years ago, I was putting together a table and chairs uh, for our deck. And I was almost done, and I noticed they must have given me the wrong piece here because this brace is way too short for these legs. What were they thinking? And why do I have so many leftover parts for crying out loud, you know? And I was trying to figure this out. Something was messed up. So I had to do what every guy in this room hates to do. (laughs) You go over and you dig through all the stuff. Where in the world are the directions, you know? And you got to look at that and say, all right. And when I realized the complexity of the project at hand, I knew I had to use some instructions. Let's get this. This is the ultimate instruction manual for your life. I believe that with all my heart. Now, you can go do life on your own. God gives you that free will and choice. You can do it. On, but when we do, here's what happened. We underestimate the complexities of the world we live in. Marital complexities, parenting complexities, relationship complexities, inner peace and joy complexities. And without God's wisdom, we'll find our lives, our marriage, our relationships laying around us in pieces. Things won't fit together and we'll be left with a mess. And on our own, we have no idea how to put it all back together again. But here's the thing about wisdom. Wisdom doesn't happen overnight. It's when you give yourself to the spiritual habits that bring it about over time. You devote yourself, you commit yourself to the way of God. It's like the commercial I saw for March Madness. They show this uh, student athlete shooting in a gym back in August and September, and the line from the commercial says, it doesn't begin in March. And spiritual growth happens the same way over time. It's giving ourselves to the spiritual habits that God will use to make us more like Jesus. The God of heaven is whispering to you right now, if you just use this book. So here's what I want us to do in this series. Let's read the Bible together. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Here's what I want us to do over the next five weeks or so. I want us to read the chapter of Proverbs that corresponds with the day that you're living. So tomorrow is the 8th. Uh, read chapter 8 on Monday. Read chapter 12 on the 12th. You know, you read each day the chapter with the day you're living in. So whatever day of the month it is, you read that chapter in the book of Proverbs. And if you're on Facebook or Twitter, use that hashtag here. I don't know if I have that. Hashtag dry run foolproof. When you make a post, make a post from a scripture that's spoken to you from that chapter that you're reading. And that enables us to sort of connect in with that and see what others are doing. Use it to share the things you're discovering with other people. So, for instance, tomorrow's Monday, the 8th, you could put something like, wow, check out Proverbs 832. Hashtag dry run foolproof. Or maybe you type out the whole verse, whatever it is. But end it with that hashtag because that hashtag will enable us to follow you and you can follow us and we can uh, study and get wisdom together from each other. Uh, Remember Alice in Wonderland? (laughs) And she comes upon a crossroads and she speaks to Cheshire, the cat, and the conversation goes something like this. Cheshire, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the cat responds, that depends a great deal on where you want to go. And Alice says, I don't care much where, to which Cheshire replies, then it doesn't matter which way you go. And the truth is, that's not just fairy tale stuff. If we don't know where we want to go, any road 
and all these people will take us where we don't want to go. Today, right now, do you know where you want to go with the rest of your life in relationship to Jesus Christ? Do you? Life's a crossroads every day. And Jesus said there's this broad way that leads to foolish destruction. And he said there's this narrow way that leads to life. But he stands. Here's the great thing about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He stands at the crossroads and says, follow me. And we do that because of this verse. In Jesus lie hidden all the treasures of what? Wisdom and knowledge. Do you know him? Let's pray.